Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Milos Shachev, and I'm here for a Stan Coach Summit uh, to present my uh, views on mas maximal hypertrophy and body recompositioning. Uh, for those of you that uh, you're not familiar with me, I was uh, IBD Pro Bodybuilder, competed over 100 times, 72 times as a pro, and uh, qualified for Miss Olympia 10 times in the 1990s in the hardest era of bodybuilding. But uh, besides my uh, bodybuilding career, I'm uh, uh, probably more known now as a coach. I've coached over 100 professionals, of which 40 uh, made it to the Mr. Olympia. And I prepared uh, many famous guys as uh, Daniel James, Dennis Wolf, um, Flex Wheeler, Ben Pakulski, one of the presenters here. You know, so I do believe that I'm um, the right person to talk about hypertrophy. So before I start, um, I want to tell you the reason why I'm even doing this is not to teach you anything, but to, to uh, make you start thinking. As Socrates quotation, uh, my favorite one, uh, that he says, I cannot teach you anything, but I can make you think. So certainly I would like you to think about uh, things that I'm going to say, compare your notes, you know, challenge what you know, and, and see maybe you can improve on something. So, uh, a lot of you guys that are watching are probably uh, scientists and researchers, and uh, I don't want to uh, step on your foot and say something wrong, but um, there is a saying that a gram of practice could be heavier than one ton of theory, and it's for a reason. Uh, my good friend, God bless his soul, Charles Polikin, many times in a, a mutual seminars and presentations would mention that hypertrophy studies that are done are usually done on a pencil next. Non-athletes. Often you can read non-trained subject or uh, uh, previously trained and then they, they do the exercises like plantar flexion or tibialis fibia uh, contraction or I, I don't know but they're coming up with that idea. What would be the easiest most controlled study to be done? On a pro bodybuilders, uh, I monitored, journaled uh, every workout, every meal, every gram of carbohydrates, protein, fat for 15 years straight. So you want a control study, you know, get the pro bodybuilders. You want a hypertrophy, get the pro bodybuilders or competitive at least. You know, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, maximal hypertrophy first. Obviously, for that to occur. You have to first uh, um, stimulate muscle to grow. So, beside uh, losing body fat, maybe in body decomposition, you know, first thing is, you know, building the muscle. Muscle is the most adaptable tissue, you know, capable of remodeling. And what do we need to do? Obviously, put some mechanical tension on that muscle. That mechanical tension, you know, can cause muscle damage, and that muscle damage would uh, uh, need to be repaired. And this is a pretty much concept of hypertrophy that uh, uh, people are talking about. It's an increase of the size of muscle cells, myosin and uh, actin and filaments, cross sectional area. And then also you can increase not just the uh, size of myofibrils, but uh, myoglobin, mitochondria, glycogen, enzymes, especially glycolytic enzymes, uh, the capillary density. So a lot of things can be increased. Uh, mechanical uh, damage that uh, uh, stimulates a repair process is uh, activating those uh, satellite cells. And we have that theory that some people are confusing. Satellite cells also can cause hyperplasia. Um, I don't believe so, but uh, uh, they do absolutely uh, get involved. They proliferate and then come to the damaged area to replenish uh, uh, the, the muscle. Also, uh, as you know, a little bit uh, uh, that science that uh, uh, inflammation happens, the uh, immune mediators, macrophages, you know, clean up the waste products, cytokine and, and uh, growth hormones or, or growth factors are being released, and all this increases protein synthesis, repair of the muscle, and making that uh, muscle bigger. Um, as I said, hyperplasia is something I uh, I'm very skeptical about uh, all the studies that experts are quoting are done on avian species, birds, not uh, uh, man. 
um, uh, heteroplasia would be increase of uh, muscle fibers and it, it would be done by splitting the, the fiber. Uh, is this possible? Textbooks of physiologies, Guyton, Harrison, anything, I, I don't know what the new ones, but uh, it will tell you it's not possible in humans and not proven. Very hard to prove, obviously. Um, so when you go into the hypertrophy, also some uh, experts would say bro science would tell you that it's sarcoplasmic and, and the myofibril, they only count uh, myofibril hypertrophy as a true hypertrophy. So um, myofibrils are uh, taking more space, yes, they say up to 80%. And uh, my fibro hypertrophy would, should be the number one uh, reason for muscle to grow. Uh, that would be uh, stimulated um, by uh, heavy duty kind of training, uh, heavy resistance, progressive overload. Uh, the, that mechanical tension would create muscle damage, usually at least suggested to be done in a centric part of move or isometric. Uh, it's uh, when muscle is overloaded in, in a stretch position. Uh, so for years, we've been hearing about go heavy, go home. Uh, Arthur Jones, Mike Manzer, Dorian Yates, proponents of a heavy duty theory with all the study that stimulate the fast twitch muscle fibers to X with extremely heavy weight. This is the only way to grow. Uh, in my experience, I train hundreds of bodybuilders and I've seen a lot of professionals that would actually do completely the opposite and train not to the failure, not to the heavy weights. They would be going for this metabolic stress type of um, uh, pump training, cell volumizing, uh, cell swelling effect, you know, basically um, increasing the um, sarcoplasmic fluid and content. And uh, this is usually done by uh, methods that I use from supersets, three sets, giant sets, drop sets, uh, all kinds of different uh, type of techniques that you can apply. I would go, I would go with the uh, various uh, uh, changes of stimulus in a tempo, in a grip, in a stance, in a uh, type of contraction. So let's talk about really when we are trying to um, train for maximal hypertrophy. Do we want uh, minimal results, optimal, or maximal? So let's define this. That all of us at all times would want a maximal results. Uh, so uh, do we need to just train specifically heavy? Um, well, ask yourself first, even though you heard that the salt rich red muscle fibers, uh, oxidative, uh, uh, small in diameter and uh, like insignificant for hypertrophy. This is always the muscle that fires first. Contradictory because contraction speed is slow, but it's a, a contracted always order of activation is slow first, go figure. Um, as I said, a lot of people using a sub-maximal load, not going to the failure, uh, having an incredible uh, hypertrophy result would make you wonder, you really have to go heavy, you know? so. You know, for me, uh, yes, you should go both. If you want a maximum stimulation of maximum amount of muscle fibers, you have to uh, apply both techniques. So my suggestion is uh, I started always uh, training with a couple of exercises that I would do in a heavy duty style, which uh, are myofibril hypertrophy specific. But uh, contrary to um, Arthur Jones or Mike Manzer that I trained with, uh, and uh, Dorian Yates specifically, and he's six times Mr. Olympia, phenomenal bodybuilder. I trained with him repeatedly in England, in uh, uh, my gym Colosseum here in uh, Gold Gym Venice. And he is really true to his belief. He would uh, warm up uh, in one set and then go all out. For me, this was always horrifying because I just don't believe that anybody uh, could be ready and uh, um, safe with this kind of method. Uh, so I would much rather uh, go for this heavy duty, but I would prepare the muscle first. So my first set uh, would be always very controlled, warm up set, 10 to 15 repetitions, uh, where I would control eccentric portion, 
I would uh, uh, overstretch, so go to the full range of motion and have that stretch overload position, uh, pause, and then I would go slow concentric, no explosive. You know, uh, it would be, as Ben Pakuski names it, muscle centric. You contract the muscle rather than uh, do the exercise and just explode up. It would be slow concentric, and at the end, I would use a peak contraction. So in a maximally shortened position, I would also squeeze. Uh, and not just squeeze, but maximally squeeze. There is a difference from tension and maximal tension. Uh, second uh, set, uh, obviously, with the progressively heavier weight, it would be uh, 10 to 12 repetitions, a little bit more challenging. But the same parameters, I would still go slow, full range, stretched, shortened, uh, prepare the body, bring the blood, activate the nervous system, you know, get prepared. Because now the third set, you can put a heavier load, go for eight to 10, eight to 12 repetitions uh, with increased load and slow eccentrically, but explosive and concentric. So now you can move the weight. But we still go short of failure. However, after these three sets, you're ready for that all out set. That one set that Dorian does, uh, Mike Menzer, that says, okay, if you can nail the nail in one hit, don't keep hitting. This is it, stimulation is done. Well, this stimulation, I think it's quite risky. Uh, at this point, I would uh, feel very safe that your body is prepared, uh, your muscle is primed, that you can go all out. All out would be six to eight reps uh, to the failure. And then beyond the failure, your workout partner would uh, force uh, a couple more reps out of you. Uh, final set not necessarily uh, all the time, but if you are really true to your uh, maximal stimulation, I would want to have that one set of maximal stimulation, just the centrics only, where I would put a heavier load than you can actually do concentrically. But you have to have a very strong training partner to uh, manage to get you on that slow eccentric. Uh, second exercise for the same muscle group, you don't need to warm up anymore, obviously but it was still uh, uh, myofibro uh, hypertrophy specific, heavy. First set, 10 to 12 reps. Um, you're already prepared, now you change the angle, change uh, 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 the, the muscle fibers that you're using, you know, change uh, you know, some parameters, different exercise. And uh, uh, second exercise, the second set of that exercise should be also all out. So that all out is done twice in two different exercises. Here also six to eight reps, two, three of the four steps. And if possible, uh, you do a couple more eccentrics on that exercise. Again, with a strong training partner. Uh, in this uh, second exercise, I like to include also two more things that are highly underutilized in recent years. I don't really see anybody do it isometric only and uh, stretch overload. Isometric, you can change the, the um, force. It can be at the beginning, mid or end range. Uh, you know, each workout you can change it, but you would go maximal 10, 15, even 20 seconds of isometric contraction. Uh, that would create a, another stimulation that usually your body is not used to. And every shock, of the system creates a more repair and more of a adaptation and a growth. And finally, that stretch overload, uh, last exercise for that uh, heavy type of training, you will get in a stretch position and uh, fairly heavy, quite heavy, and then you can try to just uh, control it in that overload position. Another great hypertrophic stimulus. After this, now I would switch to the metabolic stress type of training. Metabolic stress, crazy pumps, you know, uh, unheard of uh, giant sets, uh, stimulation type of workout. You change the angle, change the speed, go light, go heavy, go slow, go super slow, explosive, uh, you know, partial reps. Uh, try literally to bring yourself to, to the failure. And then just when you're a brick of failure, switch to do something else, something else, something else. 
So you're gonna create crazy increased blood flow to that muscle and you're gonna probably wake up those dormant muscle fibers of that muscle group that you never train because usually you train the same exercises day in, day out. You know, people usually don't make you know, much of the variation. So, uh, because we are very limited, I have to hurry. Uh, as far as stimulating, that was it. That was maximal stimulation, which would be uh, nullified if you don't have appropriate and maximal nutrition, timely and uh, adequate nutrition. Now, uh, I'm gonna tell you my theory in uh, training, dieting and re recompositioning. Uh, I don't have a 12 week diet or whatever uh, amount of time diet. I have a 24 hour diet always, every single day is very specific. And uh, you can in this 24 hour period, if you're honest to yourself, create three different phases and utilize them anytime you need them. One would be a uh, fat burning phase, okay? If you need to burn fat. So if you do need to burn uh, fat, uh, one would be the easiest, even though some people don't agree. Uh, after overnight fast, um, uh, empty stomach doing aerobic activity that triggers fatty acid utilization, uh, you're gonna 100% for sure burn body fat doing some cardio in the morning. Fat is being utilized, fat is not uh, available, your uh, fatty acids are gonna have to be released. Uh, after that, you can have a maintenance phase, obviously, you know, uh, until the moment where you're going to train. Maintenance phase would be taking enough calories uh, for uh, uh, next three hours or four hours, whatever you plan, you know, next meal to be. So you're going to have a sufficient amount of nutrients to take you through that day, through, through that period uh, to maintain. Then uh, you're going to have an anabolic phase. Anabolic phase is uh, uh, what magic happens. And if you're honest to yourself, if you really maximally prepare your body and you have all the anabolic nutrients at that time, and you do that specific training we talk about it, you're gonna trigger maximal replenishment and maximal growth. I need to say here that I'm shocked to how many people are uh, under eating, just like under training. Everybody's talking about overtraining, which you know, it's very hard to achieve. Trust me on that one. Uh, dieting, uh, I have a people coming up with the diets they previously uh, done that don't have even amount of calories equivalent to their basic metabolic rate. Uh, basic physiological needs of the body for heart to pound and your lungs to breathe and your brain to work and everything in the body to function, skin to thermoregulate, any physiological process is in that uh, basic metabolic rate uh, group, okay? Which is kind of like resting metabolic rate, not exactly, but similar. But then anything else you do throughout the day, you know, demands more calories. Training, obviously, cardio, obviously, any physical activity, you know, it's a majority of calories and you should eat accordingly to that physical activity. The remainder of the day, it's, you have that uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. If you're a couch potato or uh, you're working on a, on a computer all day long, obviously you don't have a, much of energy expenditure. But if you're a personal trainer and you go there and uh, you have actually physical, obviously you're doing much more. If you have a physical work, you know, you have to account for those calories. So please uh, don't underestimate amount of calories you needed because in order to function properly, if we uh, have enough nutrients, all the protein, carbohydrates, and fat in the right amount, so the right time, the right thing is gonna happen. If uh, something is missing, it's gonna be compromised. If you compromise, you can never have a maximal. So this is uh, where it's at. This chart is showing uh, basically uh, what I'm saying about maintaining, having a fat uh, burning phase and anabolic phase. Fat burning phase in red, obviously the first thing in the morning, uh, as I said, you do the cardio, you're gonna burn some fats. If you need accelerated uh, uh, fat burning, maybe you can have a, another uh, fat burning phase at evening before sleep. Many of pro bodybuilders, as you know, Ronnie Coleman, um, especially when he was a police officer, you know, he. Uh, if you didn't uh, have a chance in the morning, he would do it at night. Doesn't matter. Uh, you should uh, uh, 
do the fat burning phase if you need to burn body fat. If you don't, if you're ectomorphic and uh, maybe heart gainer, why on earth would uh, expose yourself to the more you know, catabolic activity when you don't need it? Even though you're catabolizing the fat, you don't have fat. So if you don't have fat, what are you going to catabolize? Uh, so the yellow line would be maintenance phase. You eat according to your needs. But then when it's training, if you are really honest to yourself and you want uh, maximal hypertrophy, you need to prepare your body. So you need to put all the nutrients there uh, with specific uh, meal planning and uh, supplementation. And then when you're training, you would have a maximal amount of this uh, anabolic, anti-catabolic fat burning nutrients that you can shove in exact muscle with your training. And that's my hyperemia advantage uh, system that I'm gonna touch in a, a second. So uh, let's talk first about uh, nutrients, not supplements. Nutrients, uh, everybody knows we have a three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Protein is the only macronutrient that builds body, builds size. Energy nutrients, carbohydrates, and fat do not. You can take 20,000 calories of those, you're not gonna grow muscles. So protein is essential. How much? Again, pencil neck RDA uh, recommended allowance in daily intake should be like 0 0.8 grams per kilo, 0 0.35 or 6 uh, grams of protein per pound, which is ridiculous. I am claiming this. I have no problem stating. It's not even minimal for survival. This is, uh, yeah, or, or let's, let's put it that way. That's minimal for survival. Uh, do you want to just survive or you want to be healthy you're going to be productive sense of well-being being strong maybe and maybe be hypertrophic so if you want to be maximally hypertrophic uh you obviously need to increase the protein dramatically how much i would never give anybody less than one gram of protein per pound of body weight yeah you heard it uh or almost two grams per kilo and i would you know go much higher I will tell you for 15 years straight, as I was competing, I had daily, and I have a journal to prove it, 450 to 550 grams of protein every single day for 15 years straight. So much about uh, renal toxicity and uh, uh, maximal absorption. All these studies that are being done, again, they're done on an untrained, old senior citizen, you know, whatever uh, examples, use a pro bodybuilder and see what happens. And I can tell you firsthand because I did. I did it myself and I did it with uh, all the other pros. Many coming, like very brilliant. Uh, Nasser somebody, for example, when he came to me, uh, he is very educated, uh, brilliant man, but he was eating 250 grams of protein. Then he saw my journals he saw how much I'm eating and he was all shocked. And I told him, you know, man, <laughs> with the amount of training and breakdown that you have twice a day, six days a week, and uh, that uh, uh, ridiculous amount of protein, I'm surprised that you're that size. And everybody saw what happened with the Nasser uh, within uh, six months after he jumped his protein. As I was eating to 500 a day, he did 600 and publicly talked about it. Uh, carbohydrates, yes. Uh, even though a lot of guys are afraid of carbohydrates and all this ketogenic uh, uh, um, type of followers, yeah, if you want to lose body fat, ketogenic diet is the greatest diet, very efficient. Yes, you're going to lose body fat. Uh, if you want a maximum hypertrophy, you cannot be in ketosis and you cannot be without the carbs. Forget about it. It's a nonsense. I mean, please think. Carbohydrates are fuel used by the muscle. Okay, you're gonna train without it. What's gonna happen? You're gonna mobilize uh, gl uh, gluconeogenesis. You're gonna actually convert your amino acids uh, or protein that you're eating, or amino acids that you're taking supplementally, or your muscle that you have to break down those amino acids to give you that energy. Uh, please understand. Yes, if you are endomorphic, I would limit your uh, carbohydrate intake. I would be in the fat burning phase and keto type of uh, scenario you know most of the day but even endomorphic and uh fatter people i'm not going to say fat bastard uh, uh 
by transphobic in definition of people who deserve or doesn't deserve carbs. If you are uh, anamorphic, a little bit uh, fatter, yeah, I would still tell you use the carbs right before the workout, inter workout, and post. This is your anabolic phase. You build the muscle, you have a more metabolically active tissue, you're going to uh, increase your metabolism and burn more calories as a result. So even if you're fat, endomorphic. Don't go on a just keto diet if you're training. When you're training, you need carbs. Do it. Ectomorphs can maybe <laughs> have a, a IV drip of carbs. I mean, I'm joking, 24 hours a day, they can eat anytime they inhale. Uh, if you're endomorphic, hard gainer, eat all you want. Mesomorph, another uh, type, uh, bodybuilders, yes, uh, monitor amount of carbs that you are spending in a workout. So Charles Potekin was very uh, vocal about that. He would take 200 grams of dextrose immediately post-workout, and reason why, that would be his estimated glycogen depletion. So if you uh, deplete 200 grams of glycogen or use 200 grams of uh, glucose uh, during a workout, should you eat that much? Makes sense to me, and this is what I've been doing. So yes, take the carbs. Fat, uh, fat uh, should be a remainder of the calories. So if you are endomorphic, uh, you cut the carbs. If you also cut the fats and you don't have enough, even enough protein, you're gonna have a, a metabolic shutdown very soon. Uh, if you're on even keto diet, and I've seen this with many clients, don't uh, have a crazy caloric deficit on keto diet. It's a double uh, edged sword because you're gonna now guarantee uh, uh, burn up your, your muscle mass. You don't have a carbs at all as a fuel. You have a very uh, few uh, grams of fat, not enough energy. Uh, protein that you're eating or muscle that you're having is going to have to be converted for survival and giving you those calories. Eat uh, uh, a sensible, common, healthy fats. Don't eat the uh, garbage food like you know some people are suggesting. Okay, if you're on keto diet, just eat whatever. Uh, so here we go. Um, this is my not trademark. I didn't trademark, but I pioneered this hyperemia advantage system, which is what taking advantage of increased blood flow to the muscle, which happens only when, when you're training. Uh, if I take in consideration that every uh, man or woman, you know, it takes seven, eight percent of the total body weight and that would be amount of blood, but I would, I would say five to six grams, uh, liters of blood that you have in your system. When you're not training, when you're inactive, there's maybe 10, 12% of that blood in your, your muscle fibers. When you do train, okay, what happens? Uh, 60, 70% of that blood goes in exact muscle that you're training, exact muscle that you want to stimulate and, and uh, create hypertrophic stimulus. So for you to visualize a little bit, uh, three to four milliliters, okay, milliliters, you know what that is, uh, per 100 grams of muscle in a minute is what is going through your muscle when you're resting, hardly anything. When you train, 100 to 200 milliliters go to that uh, 100 grams of muscle in that minute. And the highest recorded is actually 400 milliliters. So just imagine. Imagine uh, that now, okay, uh, you're training biceps or chest or whatever muscle that you're having. So all this blood is going to go into that muscle. Every muscle contraction is going to open up the cells. It's going to be ready for uptake or whatever is in the blood. And that's why I said, don't send empty blood, unprepared, unnourished blood into your muscles. When you're training, you have a golden opportunity to put all these anabolic, anti-catabolic, uh, fat burning, uh, any nutrients that you take, they're already pre-digested by the time you're training. It's in an elemental state ready for uptake. So each and every muscle contraction can insert them. Uh, so beside proper diet, did I talk about it? This would be my supplementation protocol. First, it would be pre-workout shake that you make uh, that is uh, um, so only there to saturate certain nutrients already. You know, so you're not training, but it's still not in your muscles, but you're putting 
uh, the highest mTOR uh, uh, stimulator leucine. I would usually go five grams, somebody goes more. Then I would support with the 10 to 15 grams of essential amino acids, which I find most important in supplement uh, on earth that everybody should be aware of because essential amino acids cannot be manufactured. You have to indexate them through your proper diet, complete protein. Hello, vegetarians, pay attention. Uh, or you can supplement them. So if you're vegetarian, yeah, you must take essential aminos with your meals you know, to have a complete protein. I would add uh, uh, non-essential um, amino acids, glutamine, because of the value. It's uh, highly used in uh, an aerob anaerobic type of training in a stressful position uh, situations. So uh, glutamine is absolute must, five, 10 grams. Uh, which we're going to use again after the training, but uh, Charles Colican, again, I have to mention him because he influenced me a lot. He was using up to 80 grams a day. It, it has all the other kind of other benefits, health benefits, gut benefits, but uh, this I'm talking just about workout benefits. Then you can take a creatine to increase uh, creatine phosphate, ATP, you know, anything that you find useful in a pre-workout period. This is a little formula for you to see. I use a, cit a citrulline arginine, betalanine, L-carnitine, electrolytes, everything that ca I can find a use uh, during a training. Once I start training, I don't stop at the pre-workout. Uh, I continue uh, taking with, uh, inside the workout, essential aminos, fortified with BCAAs. Now you're gonna say, hey man, BCAAs are already essential. Yes, BCAAs are three out of eight essential amino acids. Uh, utilized a lot during a workout. And a lot of people for many years was using BCAAs, inter-workout, for the wrong reason, to spare muscle glycogen. You don't wanna use spare cheap glucose uh, in your glycogen storage with expensive amino acids. So yes, I would use BCAAs and EAAs inter-workout, fortified with the uh, glucose and glucose polymers. Let the glucose be used for what is intended. And amino acid also for what is intended for the protein synthesis and muscle growth, not for energy. So please, if you take EAAs or PCAAs or both intra-workout and you do not take, do not take any glucose because sugar-free, keto diet, you don't need it. Well, what's gonna happen? You can guarantee that these PCAAs are gonna be burned up as energy. You wanna, you know, take a thousand dollar cash and put into uh, heating your house, you know, uh, for one minute, go ahead. It, it's not efficient. Finally, post-workout. Um, now, uh, blood is slowly going out of your muscles. Yeah, here it was the maximum amount of uh, hyperemia. Now hyperemia is going away, but you stimulate protein synthesis and recovery process. And for next four to six hours, or some studies said 24 hours, but I'm gonna say window of opportunity. First is that, you know, a short window that you wanna dump as much as you can. Some people don't agree. I would guarantee you it works because I've seen it, but 45 minutes, one hour, you wanna have a easy absorbable uh, amino acids, either from a fast acting um, whey protein or uh, some hydrolysate casein, uh, hydrolysate. some people like proteins, some people would still tell me, Milos, if you're true to yourself, shouldn't you stick with the just essential aminos? Yes, I believe that essential aminos uh, are a better source than uh, any protein you can take because again, if you have only essential aminos that are needed and not essential body can manufacture within and you have enough fuel, enough uh, processes inside the body that can be made. But for the sake of argument, you don't wanna take essential aminos, take a fast absorbing protein like whey, like casein, hydrolysate, or uh, whatever is your choice. Uh, at this time, I would add also uh, carbohydrates. Uh, I forgot to mention inter-workout, the carbohydrates that you're gonna take, you have to be very fast uh, acting monosaccharides like glucose, dextrose, which is the same, or glucose polymer. Right, so you don't want to maybe fructose like some people are using fructose, which needs to be, go to liver to be converted into glucose or sucrose, which is 50 50. 
you're going to have a glucose in glucose polymers. Uh, is glucose polymer uh, high molecular weight really that beneficial over dextrose? I used to believe it. In experience, it seems there's absolutely no difference. You're going to get the glucose, you know, from the glucose polymer. Okay, is this going to be faster gastric emptying or favorite osmolality? No. You're going to get the same benefits from a simple glucose, I promise you. I, I tested a million times, even though half of the people are going to tell you I'm bloated on a dextrose, half of the people are going to tell you I'm bloated with Vitargo and some other uh, vaccinase or uh, cyclic dextrin. Uh, bottom line is you need glucose intra-workout. You have to be powdered. Uh, Post-workout, you don't need a powder. Uh, you can have a carbohydrates of your choice. I love to eat carbs. Everybody loves it. Carbs are great tasting, so enjoy yourself. Uh, so at that time, you can have a, a simple carbs of your choice, and I put 70% uh, of more of a glucose. Uh, 30% it could be fructose because you still need to replenish your liver glycogen, which is about 30% of capacity, 70% muscular. You know, so yeah, uh, uh, choose your carbs. I put this 25 to 75 uh, for uh, beginners uh, and uh, average trainers. If you are training very heavy, you experience, obviously this amount of carbs can go much higher. I just had a, um, uh, muscle intelligent podcast with uh, uh, Ben Pekuska and then he reminded me back in the day when I prepared him, I gave him 150 uh, intra and 150 grams of carbohydrates post-workout. So, you know, this is something for you to think about it. Uh, you use this uh, uh, perfect opportunity to uh, shove everything into the muscle. Uh, besides macronutrients, obviously you need the macronutrients to make those macronutrients work properly, and I would always suggest double dosage, multivitamins, uh, B-complex, vitamin C. The water-based, water-soluble uh, vitamins can be overdosed. What is the damage going to happen? None. Uh, but, uh, you know, try. You take uh, whatever recommended to be doubled up and see how you feel. Uh, vitamin D3, E, Obviously, it's addition to the diet. I put mandatory daily supplements. That's something that everybody should have every day. Fish oils, essential fatty acids. If it's EPA, DHA, uh, you want a CLA, you want a krill oil, you want anything, you know, yes, uh, you need essential fats. Absolutely. Essential means the body cannot produce it. You need to intake it. Uh, Charles was suggesting up to 40 grams of fish oils. Um, you, I uh, recommend highly dosed uh, supplemental, but that all depends how much fat you're taking in your regular diet. Probiotics, obviously, uh, important thing to take. With uh, some fiber supplement, especially if you don't have a, a high vegetable uh, content in your diet. Finally, zinc magnesium or ZMA formulation of the methane glucoconti, uh, highly anabolic, highly important. Uh, minerals that need to be taken. I rushed through this um, uh, presentation because I'm time limited. I hope you could understand my English and I'm going to close uh, this uh, presentation with the Bruce Lee's quotation. Observe everything, whatever you see that is useful, adapt to it, accept it. Uh, reject what you find useless, right? It makes no point. And then create your own. So whatever system of training, dieting, or business, or whatever you're doing, you can create your own. Uh, don't be follower, be leader, right? Uh, accept anything. Accept that research that you're seeing. By all means, I read also research, but I'm highly irritated to know that always the research is done with the uh, inappropriate uh, subjects. If you want to talk hypertrophy, forget about the average person. Take the trained person and see what kind of differences you can make with a trained individual, especially if you can make a difference with professionals, which I did, which I, which is the reason why I, I feel comfortable tell, telling you about this hypertrophy course. Um, it's because I've done it, I've seen it, and I recommend it. Uh, so this is it. Um, thank you. Um,